intrigued by your willingness to hear from other people. Have you gotten better at that over time? I lead with arrogance. That's my nature. <laughs> That's a great line. I love that. I do know how hard I make it to appreciate me. Is there a moment that caused you to become more engaged in politics and life and the world? You know, I am still a sucker for the silver lining. I had an interesting conversation with Bill Gates about the work that you're doing. Here's what I would say first about Bill Gates. Hey family, it's Carlos Watson. Got a big time show for you. Sean Penn, two-time Oscar winner, stopping by the show today. Do not miss it. My next guest is widely regarded as one of the younger generation's best actors, Sean Penn. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Sean Penn. Oh, I hear some tasty waves, cool buzz, and I'm fine. Being a movie star can get in the way of acting, but Sean Penn, the actor, loses himself in every role, so we can discover a dead man walking, Mystic River's Jimmy Markham, and Harvey Milk. And the Oscar goes to Sean Penn. If there's one thing that actors know, other than that there weren't any WMDs. It's that there is no such thing as best in acting. Hey, how are you? Hey, good, good. Are you in Los Angeles or where are you? I'm in Los Angeles, yeah. Are, are you an Angelino? Did you grow up out there or where did you grow up originally? I did, I was born and raised here. Yeah, I spent a few years in New York and I lived in Haiti for a better part of a year and I've been you know, on, on jobs and some travels that have taken me for several months into other places. What has brought you to that interest in the world? What, what What's taken you to places like Venezuela and places like Haiti and other parts of the world? Uh, probably privilege. <laughs> the fact that I could get on a plane, that I could make time in my life uh, is, is the first excuse. Um, secondly, I think if anybody is awake, you can get a bit drowned in the monoculturalism of what the, the our conditioning here in the United States is. I don't know the exact statistics, but somewhere in the area of 30% of Americans is all it is that has passports. So when we hear about world perspectives, we have curiosity about the world, we're hearing it typically from people who've never traveled it. You know, I, I think I followed my nose towards areas that seemed to have, a, a, at least at that moment, a particular connection, whether negative or positive, to my own country and culture, and I wanted to see uh, the other side. Sean, who have you had the most interesting conversations with about politics, about life, about what can and should be? And I say that knowing that you've had a variety of people you've been fortunate enough to talk to. I had some of my greatest experience and connections and you know conversations that really provoked me with 19 year old Haitians uh, who had had a completely different experience. A young man came up and said, you know, it seemed to him that we were genuine in our hope to give his country a boost and he wanted to work with us to help his country. In this period of chaos that was the immediate aftermath of the earthquake, I found myself getting involved in things I'd never thought I'd get involved in. Uh, in this case, in particular, the ordering of mobile x-ray machines from a vendor in the United States. When these two mobile x-ray machines arrived, I went with a couple others in the back of a pickup truck to deliver this x-ray machine down to the DMAT hospital. And we had a round trip of about, I guess, round trip about three hours. And I figured ours would stay in a box until it came of use. By the time I got back, that young Haitian that I mentioned, he had read the instruction manual and he started processing x-rays up there in a tent. My perception of getting an x-ray machine up and running was something that took training at a medical school for a few <laughs> months or years. This young man had, had read it and done it right and safely. And today he is a certified x-ray tech here in the United States. That kind of fortitude was not something that comes from a comfort addicted society. I'm, I'm intrigued by your willingness to hear from other people. That's hard for a lot of us, or at least it's perceived as being hard for a lot of us. Have you gotten better at that over time? I lead with arrogance. That's my nature. Uh, <laughs> That's a great line. I love that. I have good ears for provocative thoughts. I did not expect this, and, and, and I want it to be very clear that I do know how hard I make it to appreciate me often. <laughs> um, 
think about President Trump's success, and, and I know that's a big, broad, open-minded question, but I know I can tell just from this conversation that you're someone who looks at things from a variety of different angles. Well, the success is revealing the ugliest part of the American soul. He is everything most simple. You know, I am still a sucker for the silver lining. And, you know, in all the ways I thought I had evolved notions socially, politically. I think that it is a good time for those who voted for the ban against gay marriage to sit and reflect and anticipate their great shame and the shame in their grandchildren's eyes if they continue that way of support. We've got to have equal rights for everyone. They've really been challenged in the last four years and certainly in the last year. You know, I'm as cynical as anybody about movements. With Donald Trump at our helm, you're on your own to recognize your own complicity. And I think it demanded it more. And that's the silver lining. To check in with how you may dismiss things for their pendulum swing radicalism too easily and not find ways to offer yourself to the balance that will lead the justifiable equality of man and woman forward. I, and I think this is in the ether now. I really feel, you know, at 60 years old, I'm <laughs> sort of glad I got to indulge some of the pettiness of what I'd been. But I'm, I'm, I'm more excited for my children that the options will be better than indulging pettiness. In your ideal world, if you were able to help us think creatively about where we could be, maybe where we should be, what would you like to see be true at the end of this decade? What would make you feel like we took some difficult situations, difficult moments, pandemics, racism, all the other things, and turned it into something much better than people would have expected? I think it's about a constitutional convention, uh, international one, on issues of preserving humanity through the use of technology rather than replacing humanity with technology. Technology has always been an extraordinary tool from the days that excited Edward R. Murrow about television. But we didn't have the humility to stop and say, this is bigger and faster than our brains, certainly than any individual brain. And we really got to be concerned about the individual in each of these things. Hey, tell me how you started getting involved with some of the vaccine distribution efforts around CORE. Was that something that was a long time in the works? Is that something new that you helped set up in response to, uh, to this moment? So CORE, which we'd started in Haiti, and we then started moving into the hurricane belt in the southern states, the Gulf, uh, here in the United States, in Puerto Rico and Bahamas, responding mostly to hurricanes at that point and not only responding, but preparing. We started doing trainings of what are commonly considered marginalized communities, trying to build trust between police departments and communities where those entities were at odds, starting with young men and women in those communities and those of the willing within those police departments, initially in Savannah, Georgia, and getting a readiness for hurricane prevention. Right. And that work, we were not deploying as a bunch of outsiders into the place. We came with a bit of technical advice and some financial resources, found existing organizations in those communities, and uh, kind of took their lead how we could you know, work together and build these things. And it was a kind of an idea that we started very small. And within a couple of months, Hurricane Matthew hit and to see about 100 of these young kids come down from Savannah down into Lumberton and, and start doing muck outs, distribute hygiene kits and so on. And that was what CORE was developing throughout a lot of vulnerable areas in and out of the Caribbean and the United States when the pandemic hit. And we went to uh, Governor Newsom here in California and raised our hand. We had also worked in the cholera epidemic in Haiti, so we'd had some experience with infectious disease, and we thought we might be able to recruit some help. In Los Angeles, we were able to kind of model this partnership between existing governance with the Los Angeles Mayor's Office and the Los Angeles Fire Department, where they had begun to set up test sites, but they were having to man them with these high skill set firefighters who had other things to do to serve the population here. And we were able to replace them about 10 to one 
on each of these sites and work with them to evolve the way the sites work and so on. And very early on, in partnership with the fire department, we started having discussions and planning discussions about what it might mean when and if a vaccine came along the transition from testing the vaccination. And as I sit here today in Los Angeles, we'll push through about 12,000 vaccinations between our fixed sites and our mobile sites in LA alone. Sean, you know, it's interesting about um, CORE and about the work that you're doing. Uh, I had an interesting conversation with Bill Gates a few weeks ago where he said, a little bit like you have firehouses where you have groups of uh, firefighters who are there and ready whenever a fire breaks out. So there's a little bit of weakness to the system in that they're not always busy, but you sure do want them when it happens. He said the same thing should be true with virus fighters, that he thought that there were gonna be unfortunately waves of viruses that we would see over the next decade or two. And consequently, he thought we effectively needed to do what you've already done, it feels like, which is kind of create a core of people who are trained and ready and might move from area to area to help people out. Have you ever had that conversation with him or with others and about the long-term importance of, of what CORE could be to what may be successive waves of, uh, of viruses? Here's what I would say first about Bill Gates, is that this is somebody who has not only put his money where his mouth is, but his significant mind in studying and understanding the most complicated dynamics on the level that understands not only the practical, but the social dynamics necessary to deal with all of the things that he's gotten into. I'm a big appreciator of the investment he's made far beyond the financial commitments of his foundation. And he's a very provocative thinker. It goes beyond virus fighters. It goes into climate cores. And I think what you can really bring it down to and what, what my mind is on is that we've become a world that can no longer deny it needs citizen participation. Governments alone cannot do what it will take to provide a safety net for futurism, for our children, for our grandchildren, for the beauty of the world, for the breathability of the world. And it's not just viruses, it's oxygen, it's clean water, and it's social. It's, you know, all of these extremes that we've come up against. And so it's my hope that in our own small way, that what CORE is looking to model is citizen service. And that service can be in forestry, it can be in elderly care, it can be in anything that you can imagine. It can be in the virus, it can be in wildfire prevention, but we've got to learn to dress up prevention as sexy. As a country, we're always, no, 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 no. I want to know, you. I want to see your certificate on the wall. Guess what, we won't have time. And there are some common sense skill sets that can be taught very quickly. And there's also a generation of incredible will, which is what we've seen with the staff we have that begin as volunteers and all of whom come out of their community within which they then work, you know, and really define core uh, far more than I define core. Core is an idea we offer. And if it's accepted, it's taken on and led by the local community and we help to resource it. And then it's also the, the architecture of it is nimble in the sense that they say, yes, I like the spirit of what you're offering, but none of the way you've done it before will work in my community. And we then say, okay, show us how. And what I'm hoping is that we build a, a replicable model going forward. And I hope that leadership in this country moves towards inspiring policy that will encourage service. Uh, Sean, who's the most intriguing world leader you've ever met? Fidel Castro and Bill Clinton. Oh, give it to me. Why, why both? Well, I, I think with Fidel Castro, he had extraordinary philosophical depth politically. None of this is an apologia for the worst of what happened with the revolution or him, but it certainly was an extraordinary person to spend time with. And Bill Clinton, for whatever flaws people perceive in him and for whatever triumphs people perceive in him, certainly was able to represent the kind of aspirational leadership as a communicator in an extraordinary way. Final question for you. Sometimes we forget about wondrous things. We think about all the beautiful things that are far away, but we forget about things that are close to us. What are some of the magical places that you've come to enjoy in and around the Los Angeles area over the years? I don't think I would have given this away uh, until very recently, but right in the middle of Topanga Canyon, if you go up 
old Topanga Canyon Road about three miles. You come on to where there's a rock wall on the left. It's not a very well-traveled road, but every minute and a half or so, you'll have a car zipping through there. And if you bring a little uh, excavating tool, you can climb up into that rock wall and start chipping, and you will find the most extraordinarily defined fossils of a time when Los Angeles was underwater. It's a great place to bring kids to because the satisfaction is, is, is inevitable. You, you don't go up there and not find fossils. You chip a little into that rock, you start finding. So that I think that's the one through my childhood into now that's probably immediately comes to mind. Hey, Sean, I so appreciate you and I appreciate the work you do. Thank you uh, for the work you do, whether it's on the vaccines or on other things as well. And just thank you for spending a little bit of time with me today. It was, uh, it was good to get to meet you. Back at you, thanks very much. Okay, all right, be safe. Okay, who wants to talk about Sean Penn first? I was super excited. I think he's somebody I really admire as an artist and as an activist. But when he said, I lead with arrogance, like, it made me like him less. Do you, do you think he was joking or you think he was completely serious about I lead with arrogance? I think he was completely serious. I think he was completely serious. I do think that the um, arrogant comment, yeah. it was very provoking. Yeah. But at the same time, it was very honest. Yeah. So, I mean, he's raw. When it comes to healthcare technology, yeah. I, I thought there was a lot of substance there. I thought he would be kind of a good contrast if you butted him up with the people that were talking on Real Talk, Real Change. Oh, interesting, say yeah. more. If you put him with like a Neil deGrasse Tyson, I think that would be a really interesting dynamic. Hey, hope you enjoyed that conversation with Sean Penn. Been a big fan of his acting for a long time. Fast Times at Ridgemont High, all the way through Milk and Mystic River, and a whole lot more. He was kind of very candid and raw. I certainly felt that. Love some of the things he said in and around policy, particularly around making prevention sexy, prevention cool. I think if we did that, it would change so many things in a good way. How we think about education, climate change, health, so many good things, so I appreciated that. Uh, he was kind of open about his privilege in a way that I didn't exactly expect him to be. Uh, and I love that he's trying to be a change agent in the ways that he is in and around core. Grateful for him doing that. Know that there's controversy there, but grateful for him doing that. You know, one of the most interesting pieces of this, though, was the after conversation. One of my uh, colleagues, Liz, talked about some of the conversations we've been having around masculinity on the show. All of that came into play when uh, Sean talked about I lead with arrogance. Was he joking? Was he not? Not sure, uh, but raises a good question. We'll be thinking about it more. Hope you'll listen to the whole podcast because you'll get the full conversation with him. And if you're liking it, don't forget what to do. Tell people and subscribe. I'll see you soon.